Well, again, welcome to Calvary Chapel, Quincy, California. Turn with me in your Bibles tonight to the book of the prophet Zechariah, chapter 12, as we continue our study through the minor prophets. The theme of the book of Zechariah, as you already know, it's on the screen for you. The Lord remembers. And again, this book is written as an encouragement to God's people. Uh, they returned uh, from Babylon after 70 years of captivity. And they faced enemies uh, outside. They faced uh, discouragement inside. Uh, they faced drought and famine. And on top of all of that, they were attempting to rebuild the temple of God and to rebuild Jerusalem. So God sent the prophets. He sent Haggai. He sent uh, Zechariah. And he sent Malachi to encourage and strengthen the faith of the people. They needed to look beyond their day and their day-to-day -day struggles and consider what great things God would do for them in the future. And you know what? We need to do the same. Amen? Amen. Sometimes it feels like we're walking through the valley of the shadow of death. But we need to remember that, that we have heaven before us. Amen? We have everlasting life before us. And so we need to consider those things as well. Now the key verse here in Zechariah is Zechariah 1, verse 17. Thus says the Lord of hosts, My cities shall again spread out through prosperity. The Lord will again comfort Zion and will again choose Jerusalem. There's a lot of agains in there. Amen? But not only did God remember his people when they had returned to the land after 70 years of captivity in Babylon, but we're going to see tonight, starting in chapter 12, that he will remember his people in the last days after they return from their worldwide dispersion that has lasted 2,000 years. He will deliver them. He will save them. And chapter 12 through the end of Zechariah, chapters 12, 13, and 14, describe that wonderful deliverance that God will bring for his people, Israel. So let's get started. If you're not already there, turn in your Bibles to Zechariah chapter 12, starting in verse 1. And I'm reading, if you, if you wanted to know, I'm reading out of the King, New King James Version of the Bible. The burden of the word of the Lord against Israel. Thus says the Lord, who stretches out the heavens, lays the foundation of the earth, and forms the spirit of man within him. Now the word burden means judgment. And in this case, it's better rendered in the King James Version of the Bible as the burden of the word of the Lord for Israel. For Israel. This is not a prophecy or judgment against Israel, but a judgment in their favor. God is going to judge for Israel in the future. This prophecy... Following Israel's rejection, if you remember from last chapter, Israel's rejection of the Messiah, their embrace of the Antichrist in chapter 11, this prophecy is all about now God reaching down to Israel, pouring out His Spirit on Israel, and Israel finally coming to repentance and to recognize Jesus as their Lord and Savior, as their Messiah. They're going to finally recognize the Antichrist for who He is, and Christ for who he is. Amen? So we can place this prophecy and the ones to follow in chapters 13 and 14 as beginning near the end of the tribulation period and flowing into the kingdom age, the millennial reign of Christ on earth. Notice once again that this is not Zechariah's word or hope for Israel, but it says here, thus says who? The Lord, thus says the Lord. It's God's word. In fact, the God of creation, it says, who stretched out the heavens, lays the foundation of the earth, and forms the spirit of man within him. This is the word and work of the Lord God, the creator. So if you have a problem with Israel, take it up with the Lord. Amen? Amen. Take it up with God. Next, we have a picture of the world in relation to Israel in the last days and the final 
attack upon Jerusalem at the battle of Armageddon. Look at verse 2. Behold, this is the word of the Lord. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. Now I'm going to quote some excerpts from uh, Pastor David Guzik and uh, Dave Hunt, uh, whom he quotes. Uh, I'm going to do this to describe the madness, the, the drunkenness of the, the Arab people, the surrounding people, uh, surrounding Jerusalem in the last days. Uh, I could have just picked all these things out of what they said, but I thought, well, they said it well enough. I'm just going to read what they said. And, and add a few comments of my own. You'll recognize my own comments in here. Well, God says that in the coming day, Jerusalem will intoxicate and stupefy the surrounding peoples. Now, similar uh, to the drunken sailor, and no offense to the Navy, by the way, similar to the drunken sailor, how, how he loses all reason when he's drunk and he wants to fight everyone, the surrounding Arab and Muslim nations will defy logic. They will lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. Their hatred of Israel will intoxicate them. The Arab people surrounding Jerusalem have a passion for possessing the city that is not justified by history. Now, I want you to listen to this carefully, okay? It's not justified by history. According to Dave Hunt, Muslims claim Jerusalem as their third holiest city. But Jerusalem, and many of you already know this, but Jerusalem is not mentioned once in the Koran. Not one time. In addition, during the centuries when Jerusalem was under complete Arab control, no Arab ruler or Islamic leader ever made it the object of a religious pilgrimage. Again, a strange indifference toward a city which is now considered to be the third holiest site in Islam after Mecca and Medina. Jerusalem's importance to Muslims comes from the belief, it's a belief, that the Dome of the Rock Shrine, that the Dome of the Rock Shrine, there's there on the Dome of the Rock Shrine, there is a rock where two significant things happen. Number one, it's where Abraham intended to offer Isaac as a sacrifice, and that we know from the Bible. And number two, where Muhammad allegedly, allegedly ascended into heaven. And, and this tradition is, is, is firmly held in the Muslim mind, but it is a tradition of recent, recent origin. It was invented, and follow this, it was invented by Yasser Arafat's uncle. Did you know that? His name was uh, Hajj Amin al Husseini, and he was the past Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. And he promoted this myth in the 1920s and 1930s to arouse Arab passions against the growing Jewish presence in Jerusalem. That's where this idea came from. Jerusalem isn't even mentioned by name in the Koran. So how could it be a place of worship according to the Koran? Most significantly, inside the, the Dome of the Rock, the Muslim shrine that sits upon the Jewish Temple Mount, inside the Dome of the Rock, there are hundreds and hundreds of verses inscribed on the walls, written from the Koran itself. But the verse, Shura 17.1, which describes Muhammad's mythical trip to heaven, claimed to be from Jerusalem in the 1920s and 30s, that verse is not among one of them inscribed in the Dome of the Rock. Isn't that interesting? In fact, inscribed on the outside of the Dome of the Rock, and I've been there and seen it a couple of different times, it says, of course it says in, in, in Arabic, I can't read Arabic, but I'm told this is what it says. It says, God is not a father and he has no son. Isn't that interesting? Well, the very passage in the Koran 
that later supposedly justified the building of the Dome of the Rock, according to uh, Yasser Arafat's uncle, is not even included among the hundreds of passages of the Koran inscribed in it. The Dome of the Rock was not built because of the Koran, but because the Muslim ruler, a guy by the name of Abdal Malik, wanted to gain revenue, taxes, from pilgrims and worshipers, and because he wanted to prevent the rebuilding of a Jewish temple. That's why the Dome of the Rock is there. Islamic passion for Jerusalem is indeed like drunkenness. It's deception. It's madness. It's not based on truth. And there are no real historical facts to support it. Now, if Muslim passion for Jerusalem is a mystery, the Jewish claim to the city is entirely scriptural. The fact that Jerusalem is mentioned more than 800 times in the Bible makes it worthy of attention. This unique city is the only one upon which God has bestowed his distinctive blessing and protection according to Psalm 132 verses 13 and 14. It's the only city for whose peace we are commanded to pray in Psalm 122 verse 6. God says he has chosen Jerusalem as the place where he has put his name forever. And you can read that in 2 Chronicles 6.6, 6, 2 Chronicles 33.7, Psalm 46.4, Psalm 48 verses 1 through 8, and Psalm 87 verse 3. The new heavens and the new earth contain the city of my God, the new Jerusalem. And you can read about that in Revelation 3.12 and Revelation 21.2. It's all over the Bible, you see. That there will be a heavenly Jerusalem, according to Hebrews 12, 22, but no heavenly New York, Paris, London, Mecca, Medina, speaks volumes. Now, lastly, we see in this verse that there is coming a future and final battle, the battle of Armageddon. It says when, not if, it's coming. When they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. So there is coming a final battle. We'll look more at this as we go through this chapter. Now look at verse 3. And it shall happen in that day. Now that's an important phrase and we'll look at that. In that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, although all nations of the earth are gathered against us. So starting in this verse through the end of Zechariah, we're going to see that phrase, in that day, used 14 times. In chapter 14, verse 1, that day is defined for us as the day of the Lord. In eschatological terms, that means eschatology is simply the study of last things, right? That's eschatology. So in eschatological terms, this day, the day of the Lord, begins with the start of the tribulation, it includes the battle of Armageddon. It includes the return of Christ, the kingdom age, and at the end of the millennium, the destruction of the present heaven and earth before God creates a new heaven and earth with a new heavenly Jerusalem. So in that day, the day of the Lord, in that day during the tribulation period, after the church has been raptured to heaven, God will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. Jerusalem will become a burden for the whole world, a very heavy stone. It is already a burden for the world. Nations will attempt to deal with the problem of Jerusalem, as they have already been doing now for decades. Modern American presidents have attempted to bring peace to the Middle East, and yet that peace continues to elude them all. It says all who would heave it away 
will surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. Every nation that comes against Israel, and specifically Jerusalem, will find their end. You know, before General Allenby of Great Britain took control of Jerusalem by way of the Palestinian mandate, they used to say the sun never set on the British Empire because their, their influence, their colonies, stretched across the globe. But now, their influence has been reduced to fighting with the Argentinians over the Falkland Islands and seeing their future king disrespected recently in the Bahamas. Why? Because they came against Jerusalem. Every civilization that has come against Israel has been destroyed. Every one of them. Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Greece, Rome, the last Islamic caliphate, Germany, Great Britain, and a host of lesser nations such as the Amorites, Moabites, Edomites, the Philistines. Anybody know any Philistines? You know any Moabites? How about Amorites? They're gone. Why? Because all who would heave it away will surely be cut to pieces. Though all the nations of the earth are gathered against it, and all the nations of the earth will be gathered against it at the Battle of Armageddon. There is coming, you see, one final battle. The Battle of Armageddon when all the nations... What does all mean, by the way? All. That includes America, by the way, if we're still around. All nations of the earth will be gathered against it. They gather for two things. To destroy Israel once and for all and to prevent the return of Christ to earth. Can you believe that? We talked about this Sunday just briefly as it come up. I don't know what they think they're going to do. Shoot missiles at Jesus as he comes in on the white horse from the, from the heavens? They won't succeed. You can read about that in the book of Revelation chapter 19. But they will gather together for that purpose. It will be drunkenness. They will be intoxicated with hatred for God and hatred for God's people. In verse 4 it says, In that day, what day? The day of the Lord, right? In that day, says the Lord, I will strike every horse with confusion and its rider with madness. I will open my eyes on the house of Judah and I will strike every horse of the people with blindness. So in that day when they come against Jerusalem, when they come against God's people, there will be mass confusion and mass casualties. I wonder if horses will actually be used in this battle uh, and will be confused, or if this is Zechariah's way of describing some form of modern technological confusion. Perhaps during this battle, satellites stop working. Missile systems don't function right. Jets fall from the sky. Cell phone and radio communication is down. The troops in the field of battle are left to themselves without any support or command and control. It says here, I'll strike every horse of the people with blindness. The people who are on the battlefield, it'll be as if they're, they're, they're fighting blind. They won't have their technology to support them. With all the armies of the world gathered to the valley of Armageddon, they begin to turn on one another in the confusion. It says in chapter 14, verse 13, it says, it shall come to pass in that day, the day of the Lord, the one we're talking about. It shall come to pass in that day that a great panic from the Lord will be among them. Everyone will seize the hand of his neighbor and raise his hand against his neighbor's hand. So in the confusion of battle, they begin to fight one another, to kill one another. And, verse 5, the governors of Judah shall say in their heart, the inhabitants of Jerusalem are my strength in the Lord of hosts. They're God. In that day I will make the governors of Judah like a fire pan in the woodpile and like a fiery torch in the sheaves. They shall devour all the surrounding peoples on the right hand and on the left. 
but Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place. Where is that? Jerusalem, it says. So in this battle, God is going to give strength to his people. With God's help, they're going to be uh, victorious in the battle. They will be like a fire pan in the wood pile and like a fiery torch in the sheaves. This, this paints a picture of how rapidly they will be able to move against those who have come against them. You see, they're going to burn right through their enemies like a fire would burn through dry brush on a summer day. That's the picture that's being painted. While their enemies are destroyed, it says they shall devour all the surrounding peoples on the right hand and on the left. So while that is taking place, Jerusalem is spared. But Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, Jerusalem. So make no mistake. Jerusalem will be inhabited in the exact location it's at today by the Jews in the coming kingdom age. There won't be any UN high commission to decide the fate and ownership of Jerusalem. God has and God will decide in favor, you see, of his people. Amen? Amen. We got to be clear on this. Don't be fooled by all the fake news and everything you read. I mean, you can see where this world's going. It's crazy. The things that, the th calling right wrong and wrong right, it, it's insane out there right now. It's getting ready for the coming of the Antichrist, which will proceed and usher in the tribulation period. By the grace of God, we will not be here for that. Amen? We'll talk about that in a minute too. Now look at verse 7. The Lord will save the tents of Judah first so that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem shall not become greater than that of Judah. So to prevent pride among the house of David and the people of Jerusalem, God is going to save uh, the outlying area first, the, the tents of Judah. God hates pride. <laughs> Even in victory, God hates pride. Amen? Now look at verse 8. In that day, the day of the Lord, in that day, the Lord will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. The one who is feeble among them in that day will be like David. And the house of David shall be like God, like the angel of the Lord before them. King David was a mighty warrior. In the coming day of the Lord, at the battle of Armageddon, even the weakest, most feeble Jewish man is going to be a mighty warrior like David. Isn't that incredible? And then the mighty, the mighty warriors, they're going to seem like God himself, like the angel of the Lord. You remember in the Old Testament, an angel of the Lord slew what? What was it? Uh, 200 and some thousand Assyrians in one night's work? I forgot. I think I got the number wrong. But it's a huge number like that. What was it? 185,000. 185,000 Assyrians in one night's work. So the Jews are going to be like that against their enemies. God, you see, is going to supernaturally empower his people. It shall be in that day. What day? The day of the Lord. Verse 9. It shall be in that day I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Every nation that fields an army against Jerusalem and God's people to prevent the return of Christ will be destroyed. We read about the means of their destruction in chapter 14, verse 12 of Zechariah. It says this, And this shall be the plague with which the Lord will strike all the people who fought against Jerusalem. And here it is. Their flesh shall dissolve while they stand on their feet. Their eyes shall dissolve in their sockets, and their tongues shall dissolve in their mouths. I don't know about you, but I don't want to come against Jerusalem. I kind of like my eyesight and my tongue. That almost sounds nuclear. Like God, God is going to go nuclear, right? Now look at verse 10. 
And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. This is messianic. As a result of these great miracles and deliverance, and more importantly, because God supernaturally pours on them the spirit of grace and supplication, Israel will finally come to faith in Jesus as their Messiah. First, it says they will look on me whom they pierced. Salvation starts with that first point, looking to Jesus, doesn't it? That's how salvation starts. We look to Jesus. And they're going to see Jesus for who he is. And second, they repent. It says they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. So they will finally look to Jesus, finally realize what they have done to him. They've rejected him and even pierced him. And then they will mourn deeply. And their mourning is going to be like, like as if you lost your firstborn child. And for them, the firstborn was a big deal in their time. Much bigger than it is for us today. I mean, it's a tragedy today should we lose one of our children. But for them, it was a great, great tragedy. And, 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 and great mourning would take place if you lost your firstborn son. And so Israel is going to mourn like that. It's going to be a deep, deep mourning. In fact, the text goes on to, to describe this mourning. Look at verse 11. In that day, there shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem, like the mourning at Hadad Rimon in the plain of Megiddo. And by the way, the plain of Megiddo is the same plain as Armageddon. Okay? When the beloved King Josiah died, there was a great national mourning. It's described for us in 2 Chronicles chapter 35, verses 20 through 25. The prophet Jeremiah even mourned. And lamentations were, were written for Josiah. And they, they were then sung for years to come after his death. This man was beloved. And, and they went out and they wept for him. And they cried out for him. And, and they wrote songs about him. What's going to be like that? There's going to be this national mourning as they recognize what they have done to Jesus and as they repent of their sins and come to faith in Christ. Now look at verses 12 through 14. And the land shall mourn, every family by itself, the family of the house of David by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Nathan by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Levi by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of Shimei by itself, and their wives by themselves, all the families that remain, every family by itself, and their wives by themselves. So this morning is going to be so deep, so heartfelt. You know, you ever go before the Lord and you've got this burden it's just you and the Lord amen you can't even share it with someone else you just have to go and get on your knees before the Lord yourself and just cry out to God you ever been there I know many of you have we often end up in that place amen well that's where the Jews will be it's, we're not going to gather together in a big prayer circle we're so burdened. This is such a heavy, heavy thing when they realize that they've rejected the Messiah and even been part of his murder that they're just going to go off by themselves and fall on their faces, fall on their knees and mourn and weep in repentance. They can't even get together. They can't even get together with their own wives to pray. They don't pray by themselves. You see, yeah, this is a description of a deep heart felt repentant mourning. Israel, you see, finally comes to faith. They come to recognize that Jesus is the Messiah. And while they repent of their sin, they receive him as their Lord and Savior. You see, the Bible says, thus all 
Israel shall be saved. In fact, we read that in Romans 11.26. We'll read that in a minute. Isn't it good to know how it all ends? Isn't it good to know that God will make good on His promises to His people Israel? And if God fulfills all His promises to His people Israel, guess what? God will make good on all His promises to us, the church, as well. Amen? God is the one and only true promise keeper. We can take comfort in seeing the promises of God fulfilled for His people Israel and his city, Jerusalem. God has, you see, a glorious future for them. They're going to go through the fire. They're going to walk through the valley of the shadow of death before they get to the mountaintop of glory, right? But they are going to get there. In fact, the Bible says in Romans eleven twenty six, it says, and so all Israel will be saved as it is written. The deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob for this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. And we just read when that's happening. When God is going to pour out upon them the spirit of grace and supplication and take away their sins. They're going to look upon Jesus whom they pierced. They're going to recognize he's the Messiah. They're going to receive him. They're going to mourn for their sin. But they're going to get up in faith and enter enter into the kingdom age, the millennial reign of Christ on earth in their natural bodies as believers in Jesus Christ. Isn't that incredible? What an incredible chapter before us. And by the way, God's, what's God's plan for the church? We just read what God's plan for Israel is. Well, what's God's plan for the church? It's to deliver us from the wrath to come. According to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10, and 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9, and many other scriptures as well. We will not be going through the tribulation. So we can take comfort in that, and we can look for the coming of Christ to take us to heaven. Amen? Amen. In fact, let me read. I, I want to turn here and read as we close today. Uh, turn in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I just want to read this in closing today before we pray. Starting in verse 13. But I do not want you to be ignorant brethren concerning those who have fallen asleep. That's a euphemism for death. Lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For since... That's what that word if means. It's in the first conditional clause in the Greek language. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep or have died in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. When that word caught up was translated, by the way, into the Latin by Jerome, Okay, it was translated as with the word rapture. Okay, we, we shall be caught up or raptured together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Amen? Amen. So that's, that's our hope. Our hope is in the rapture of the church before the tribulation begins. Israel's hope is, in it, is that God is going to take them through the tribulation period and bring them to faith in the Messiah. Amen? All right, let's pray and we'll have the worship team come back up for one final song. Heavenly Father, once again, thank you so much for your word tonight. What a, what a powerful word from the prophet Zechariah. Lord, you 
not only do you know the future, but you've had the future written down here for us. We can see clearly and plainly what you have planned, Lord, for your people Israel, what you have planned for the unbelieving world. And as we look, Lord, uh, in First Thessalonians, what you have planned for us, the church, we thank you, Lord, for the plans that you have made and that you will keep every promise that you've made both to Israel and to the church. Lord, help us in these last days to walk by faith, to look to you, to trust in you, no matter what we see going on in the world. Lord, you said in, in uh, Matthew 24 that there would be wars and rumors of wars. There would be pestilence. There would be disease. There would be earthquakes in various places. You said that these are the beginning of sorrows. We're going to see some of these things taking place even in our lifetime. Help us, Lord, your people, to walk by faith, to trust you in the midst of a world that seems to be spiraling out of control, knowing what the future holds. And we pray these things now in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. And everybody said, Amen, Amen. amen.